Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Verner, and I'm the Programs Director at Carolina Breast Friends. We are so pleased today to have Amber Tuning with us. She has her doctorate in physical therapy with a focus in women's health from Duke University, and she did her undergraduate work at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm not sure why she decided to go to Duke <laughs> after she was in Chapel Hill, but we'll forgive her for that. She was the lead physical therapist at MD Anderson Cancer Center and participated in several research initiatives to standardize best practice for breast cancer survivors early in her career. And she has advanced training in lymphedema, pelvic health, and myofascial release. She now works at the new cancer center at Novant, serving cancer survivors in the Charlotte area. And we are so pleased to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's nice to meet everyone informally here on Zoom. Um, thank you so much, Leslie, for kind introduction. And thank you to a special patient that's here tonight for kind of being brave enough to share her experience and get the word out because we love doing this and patients really are our best advocates. So we appreciate that. Um, I really feel that knowledge is is power in this experience and it gives patients a sense of control and as they go through something that oftentimes leaves them feeling like they don't have any control. So I'm going to keep our presentation fairly short and simple. Um, we save some time for questions and answers at the end because I really think that's really important and um, just allows people to kind of be open about what they're dealing with and, and troubleshoot and talk through some things. Um, and I also want to do my own introduction to Virginia Sabins, who's a colleague of ours. She's new to us at Novant, but has a great load of experience in the world of women's health as well. Um, she came to us from Sloan Kettering, so a really lovely, extensive background in this world, too. And she's going to kind of help out with a few of my slides, um, just because I think she's a library of knowledge. And that way you have two of us to kind of troubleshoot some questions through. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, but let me know if you guys cannot see what I'm doing here. You should be able to see my PowerPoint. And let me also say that this is not meant to be medical advice. I know you guys participate in these um, informational sessions quite often. So we kept it again, pretty open-ended with no really specific details about um, your experience. So just keep that in mind as, as we move through. But I'm gonna go ahead and let Virginia start with kind of our introduction here about what is your pelvic floor before we get too far about pelvic floor physical therapy. Like what the heck is your pelvic floor, right? <laughs> so let's talk about that first. And she should be able to unmute herself to kind of talk us through this first. Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you all so much for joining on the call. Um, thank you all for your support for what we do. Um, and I totally echo what uh, Amber said, knowledge is definitely power and we love sharing what we know, if it can be a resource and help for you. Um, so yes, we look forward to all of your questions, but let's get into it. Um, I am a visual learner and I love pictures and um, models and handouts. So first, before we get into what the pelvic floor is, on this slide, I just wanted to bring us to what we are looking at on the picture on the right. So this is a female pelvis. It is the view as if you were looking at someone about to give birth, like at the other end of the stirrups. So we're looking bottom up and at the first layer. And then, so you'll see from top down the top is really our pubic bone and you'll you'll notice the hips are at the side and the back part is the tailbone or the coccyx so the pelvic floor we're really talking about this sling of muscles that go from that pubic bone in the front and all the way around to the tailbone and i often relate it like a hammock so um they, they really support the organs, um, like your bowels, your bladder, the uterus, they all sit inside that nice bowl and, and the sling of muscles really work to hold them up and connect your pelvis together to give us a lot of stability. 
So that's what we mean when we say that the pelvic floor is part of our core. They really create the foundation for your, your body. I think of them at like the foundation of your house. So very important group of muscles. Uh, and we like to say, you know, everyone has a pelvic floor. Sometimes men are surprised that they have the pelvic floor, but the muscles are the same. There's just a little bit mechanical differences. Um, and obviously the organs are a little different, but everyone has a pelvic floor. So you can relay all this information to your, um, your friends, your husbands and brothers, family, um, anything that um, we deal with as women, they can also deal with us men. Right, so we treat a whole slew of, um, you know, dysfunctions that can happen. So I think that sometimes women especially are just accustomed to dealing with things. Um, and we think that, you know, we're women and this happens to us and we, it's okay, we can deal with it. But there are clinicians, Amber and myself are, are some of them that can definitely help. And um, any of these things you see listed does not have to be your reality. There's help out there and we wanna be that resource for you to understand your body and understand how it works and, and get you the help that you need. So some things that we see as pelvic floor physical therapists are, you know, bowel and bladder issues. So we see urinary leakage, sometimes associated with um, strenuous activities like exercise, but also smaller things like coughing, laughing, sneezing, sometimes a little bit of urine comes out. So that is something we call stress incontinence or leakage under stress. Um, the other things that we see are urinary leakage associated with a strong sense of urgency. Like you have to rush to get to the bathroom, that, that sense that you're not gonna make it there in time. And sometimes we refer to this as a small bladder. Or you could be going all the time getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom a few times. And you're just feeling the overwhelming sense that you always need to empty your bladder. Moving into some of the pain situations, we deal with a lot of pain during sex and intercourse. And, um, and a lot of that we can do so much to help with. Um, and so it definitely is a big area of what we see and what we can help with. Um, moving kind of down into more bowel dysfunction, there's certainly a lot of constipation issues. I know this is a big, big deal with chemotherapies. Um, they can kind of do a number on your, on your bowels. So we have a lot of tools to help, help you get things moving better um, and, 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 you know, associated with that, we can see a lot of tailbone pain or rectal pain, especially with sitting uh, and intolerance with that. And we also see pregnant and postpartum women, which is so wonderful that we can, we can help. I always tell my women that Every single woman in France gets pelvic floor therapy after she has a baby. And I just implored that women in the United States just don't even know that we exist. Um, so I love when we get referrals for pregnancy and postpartum because it's just opening up this knowledge base to women that I think is so helpful. And then along with the pelvis, it's connected to all the other regions of your body. So we see a lot of low back pain, hip pain, groin, or even abdominal discomfort. I would say a lot of times after surgery, we have, we can have a great deal of abdominal pain, especially if we have abdominal surgeries. So that's something that we can play a huge role in helping you through. Thank you. I'm going to jump back and kind of share a little bit more about pelvic floor physical therapy as it relates to our survivors of breast cancer. Um, this is a huge area and 
we are constantly working to get the word out about pelvic floor physical therapy. And that's educating patients like yourself, that's educating our physicians, that's educating our oncologists and radiation oncologists. Um, and we're getting there. I will just kind of like lay a blanket statement that we're getting there, but it's slow. A lot of our patients go through physical therapy. I would say it's usually related to range of motion, surgery, possibly lymphedema. Um, but pelvic floor physical therapy is less known to a lot of our great oncologists. So we're trying to reach out to them to kind of say, Hey, all this other stuff can happen too. And sometimes they're not asking about it. So Again, that's why we love doing these types of presentations. Um, you guys know better than I do that the current standard of care with patients often includes chemotherapy, radiation, and various degrees of surgery. Um, for specific types of cancers, drugs such as tamoxifen, AIs, they've all been shown to um, further improve survival rates, which is awesome. But unfortunately, the use of those drugs can often cause certain gynecologic side effects and symptoms such as vaginal dryness, pelvic pain, incontinence, and prolapse. And to kind of piggyback off of what Virginia had stated was, I think as women in particular, we kind of say, okay, I'm aging a little bit. I've been through cancer. I'm alive. I have dryness. Okay. And a lot of people kind of settle for that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, so that's why we're here to say that it's important to speak with your medical team about these symptoms if you're experiencing them. Um, pelvic floor physical therapy can offer a conservative approach. It's usually a tool in our toolbox. It's not always the sole treatment that we recommend, but it definitely can, can be um, a big part of, of getting better. So what do we do? <laughs> I get at least one call a week and I always chuckle a little bit from a patient that maybe has been sent to pelvic floor physical therapy. And they're like, Amber, Hey, I had back pain like a year ago and I saw this guy and I was in a gym and I was doing the leg press. Like, how's, how's this gonna, like, how does pelvic floor physical therapy work here? So I always take the time to explain to them that, okay, it's a little bit different. Most people that have been trained in formal pelvic floor physical therapy, um, we do it in the privacy of, of a clinical room. Um, and again, it, the most important thing is to have open and honest communication. I always go into it telling patients, you can tell me as little or as much as you want to. Um, so it's not a time to be shy. And oftentimes I find it's the first time people have talked about this stuff, maybe before they've even communicated with their husband or significant other. Um, so we peel back a lot of layers. Um, and so that's why I'm always so appreciative when people can be open, but we also understand that maybe it's not the right time to share and that's okay too. But we always sit down with patients and do what's called a subjective evaluation. And that's where we talk. You know, most of the time I have a lot of information about my patients already, but I always wanna hear from the patients in their own words because the doctor writing down pelvic pain in your chart isn't always the best description. Maybe it's pelvic pain with intercourse, or maybe it's pelvic pain when they're sitting down, or maybe it's pain when they're urinating. So we just wanna get a little more detail to give you the best personalized care. Um, we also really try to do a good orthopedic assessment of your hips, your low back, and your posture. Um, like Virginia said, everything's connected. And so the pelvic floor is kind of right in the middle. So a lot of times if there's hip dysfunction or problems in the low back or in the tummy, it often connects to your pelvic floor and it's kind of part of the picture. Posture is huge in a breast cancer population. Um, you know, I often find my patients, they come to me with pelvic pain and they're sitting in the chair and they're very rounded forward. Their shoulders are hunched. Maybe they're tight from radiation. And when you round forward like that, if you even want to try it in your chair right now, what does your pelvis do, right? It kind of crunches up and might roll back in the chair. So a lot of times we want to look at your posture and what kind of treatments you've had specifically for breast cancer, because that can relate. Um, we talk a lot about pain levels. Like I mentioned, we kind of want to know what type of pain is it on the outside? Does it feel more deep? That way we can kind of figure out where to go. We talk a lot about your current bowel and bladder practices, what exactly you're experiencing, because that all can connect. Um, we're not nutritionists, but we do talk a lot about nutrition and lifestyle, and that can play a role. We look for triggers if we're having urinary issues, triggers if we're having bowel or constipation issues. We might ask about certain foods that we often know cause inflammation in the body. Um, we just wanna know a little bit more about kind of your routine. 
And then I guess the bread and butter of what we do is an internal and external assessment of your pelvic floor. Most of the time, this happens maybe on the first visit, usually on the second, because it takes us time to kind of go through a lot of this information that I just listed. Um, and sometimes patients aren't always ready to do an internal exam the first day, and that's okay. But we always try to, because again, if I was going to see you in my office and you came to me for shoulder pain, well, I'm not just going to send you out the door without touching your shoulder and say, okay, we'll just move it up and down 10 times a day. It'll get better. We want to feel it. We want to touch it. We want to know if it's tight or tender, or if there's certain muscles that are working on the front and other muscles that aren't working on the back. So we just really want to do a really thorough hands-on assessment. And I would say that's often when patients are kind of surprised by their experience, that's often what they're most surprised by. Um, for what it's worth, the majority of patients, it's a little bit easier than what your doctors put you through. We don't use, typically use speculums because um, we're just looking at everything from a musculoskeletal level. So I always try to tell patients that so they know what to expect, especially if they're fearful or hesitant or dealing with pain. This next slide, I, um, I initially had a clip art visual of a person sitting there and they had a heart in one hand and a brain in the other, and they were trying to balance heart and brain because what I'm about to say always comes from a good place. But a lot of our patients in the oncology world, specifically with breast cancer, a lot of their impairments they're also dealing with pain. So they might have some urinary things that might think, okay, this just feels like I need to be stronger. But when someone has tension or pain or they've been through trauma in a way, we also want to address that first and foremost. And so a lot of patients maybe have tried this on their own, or maybe they've seen physical therapy for other issues and the therapist has maybe encouraged them to try Kegels. A lot of times, maybe even 90% of the time, that's great and it's appropriate and it could even help. But I always say beware of the Kegel therapist because too many or maybe even performing them incorrectly can often re lead to poor results. So that's something I always want to clarify with patients. Um, you know, are you if they're coming to me with issues like have you tried Kegels in the past? And if they have, are they working? And if they're not, maybe there's something else we need to kind of dive into. And if you're sitting there thinking like, oh, shoot, well, I've been doing Kegels and maybe I'm not. Again, that's not any bad news. It's usually a good thing. Um, it's just something that if you're still having issues, even after trying that, you may want to look into pelvic floor physical therapy as an option. So what I'm going to talk us through next is some examples of pelvic floor relaxation. Again, I think when we think pelvic floor um, and we think of those muscles that Virginia was describing, we think of Kegels and contracting, if you've ever heard that phrase before. So you may think, okay, I'm going to use these muscles, like I'm stopping my urine flow. But what I find in our oncology population, especially if they're dealing with pain and dryness, is we actually want to start with a lot of relaxation strategies. Um, so I've listed here a few, and we're going to try to practice a few together and just see if you guys can, can feel what I'm talking about. Um, we use a lot of visualization and imagery um, because these muscles are inside of us. They're a little bit tricky to find. So um, we do a lot of discussion, like Virginia mentioned, we're very visual here. We use a lot of models and, and talking and kind of helping our patients find these muscles inside of them. We do what's called diaphragm breathing or belly breathing. If you've ever done yoga or Pilates, you may be familiar with this. It's also used in meditation. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. We often give our patients a lot of exercise parameters. Some people, you know, when they hurt or they're having leakage, they're, they're scared to move. They're not sure exactly what to do. So we do try to give a little bit of exercise guidance. Um, specifically for pain issues. And when we're trying to get something to relax, we often keep it low impact. So think walking, swimming, yoga. We talk a lot about positioning as well. Um, and that could be posture, like I mentioned. That could be the position you're in when you try to have a bowel movement, which I know sounds crazy, but there's a right way to sit on the toilet. And we talk to patients a lot about that based on what they're dealing with. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we use a lot of meditative strategies. I work in integrative medicine, so a lot of my patients kind of come prepared for that aspect, but a lot of patients are surprised by that when they go to pelvic floor physical therapy. So let's try this together. This is a crazy picture, but I, I use it a lot. Um, and I think it, 
is a really nice visual if you kind of can take a moment to process. And you might not be able to read the small print and that's okay, but I just want you to kind of look at the arrows. So a lot of times when we breathe in, and again, I think this has a lot to do with as women, we're kind of trained to like inhale and hold tension and we kind of suck our belly button in all the time. We tend to kind of hold our breath and draw everything up and in when we take a deep breath of air. When in reality, what should happen in a normal, healthy pelvic floor is as we inhale, our belly extends out. The diaphragm pushes the abdominal wall out and our pelvic floor muscles that are deep inside of us drop down a little bit. And I would say very rarely do I have a patient that comes and sees me and that is natural to them. They know how to do that. So that's one of the biggest things I work with patients on the first day is just trying to correct the way they breathe. Because you can see here, we keep saying it's connected. And this is a really nice visual to explain that. We can see as our diaphragm comes down, our belly wall comes out, you can see how all that pressure is going to help our pelvic floor muscles relax. And then kind of the opposite happens when you exhale. Our diaphragm comes up, our abdominal wall kind of sinks back down, and our pelvic floor kind of deflates or recoils back into that resting position. So let's try it together if you're up for it. And of course, if at any point you guys are short of breath, you feel uncomfortable or lightheaded, back off because I'm not there to double check everybody. But I will tell you to put one hand on your chest and one hand on your stomach. And if you're reclined, just try to sit up a little bit so you can feel that. Almost shift your pressure kind of right underneath your pelvic bones so you're sitting up nice and tall. And as you inhale, most of us will naturally chest breathe. That top hand will lift up. So my challenge to you is to try to inhale and try to keep your top hand relatively still and flat. Feel your bottom hand kind of distend away from your body. And that will mean that you're using your diaphragm. That is one of the easiest ways to try to get that pelvic floor area to just oh, relax finally. Um, I will say it's a little bit easier to feel laying down for a lot of people. Not that you need to change positions here because what's beautiful about pelvic floor is a lot of it can be done in multiple positions. Um, but that's a strategy that I always teach patients on usually the first day if they're dealing with pain, tightness, or dryness. And then here comes the guided imagery that I talk about. So a lot of you are like, okay, I don't really feel anything in my pelvic floor. I can maybe feel my belly and my chest, but like, I don't feel anything down there. And let me say that's normal because it's not something that comes natural to a lot of us. So we try to use guided imagery to kind of gain that awareness of what's actually going on down there. And honestly, when someone has decreased awareness of that area, a lot of times that's part of the problem. So again, this is really normal if you're not feeling much. But these are some cues that I'll use with my patients. Um, you can think of your pelvic floor dropping down towards the ground or gently bulging as you inhale. Um, like Virginia mentioned, it kind of sits like a little hammock. So kind of visualize that hammock just dropping down slightly. You may imagine your sit bones moving away from each other. So where you're sitting, kind of those hard bones on the bottom of your butt kind of move away as you inhale. You might imagine your pubic bone and your tailbone moving away. Everything's kind of stretching. You kind of see the trend. You might think of your actual vagina opening and that's okay too. Um, you might think of the vulva or the scrotum if you're a male kind of dropping down. Or you may imagine something yawning, kind of this like slow, gradual opening. So all this stuff can get a little funky, but I always laugh because there's always something that works for somebody. It might be like the quirkiest little thing, but once you get it, you usually get it. So it's pretty cool to see. The next two slides are just some really basic yoga positions that overlap really well with pelvic floor physical therapy. So no one needs to like get out of their chair and drop to the floor or anything. And I will say that the models in my picture are quite flexible. Um, so it's often modified from the majority of my patients. But this combines a lot of different aspects of what we do. We might talk about positioning. Okay, we might talk about flexibility of your low back and your hips. We might talk about your pelvic floor and what it's actually doing. So an exercise like this, you may say, oh, I do that all the time, or I've done that in yoga, or what is the heck is that doing? Like you might have that thought too, but this combines a lot of aspects of what we do. It's particularly with um, breast cancer survivors and patients that have pelvic dysfunction. Child's pose is another one. It's really similar. We're just in a slightly different position. 
everything kind of involves this like spreading and widening. We're relaxing the pelvis. We're breathing. So all of that is really important to kind of find where our pelvic floor is and feel what it's doing. So I just wanted to talk you guys through a few examples of, of what we do. And then I always finish with this slide because usually I do a presentation and people are like, okay, great. I had one, two, three of those things that you guys mentioned. Now what? Um, so obviously Virginia and I, we work at Novant Health. If you're in the Charlotte area, we can always talk you through how to kind of get a referral to find someone who can help you. But I also include these two different types of directories. I use these often for my patients that live far away or travel. Um, and all the therapists listed in these directories have had some kind of training in pelvic floor rehab and they're qualified to do internal exams. So when I scared everybody and said, beware of the Kegel therapist, this is usually going to be someone who's had appropriate training that could, that could take care of you. Um, in the oncology world though, it is always, always important to talk with your medical team and say, Hey, I, you know, is this appropriate for me? Cause sometimes there is some kind of, um, you know, contraindication, if maybe there's been surgery. So we always just want to have that communication as well. But I always end with this just in case anyone is kind of thinking in the back of their brain that I might need some of this, but that was my presentation. And thank you for Virginia to kind of speaking as well about some of our anatomy. That's really important, but I'll um, let Leslie kind of open it up for questions or comments and hopefully there's some discussion. Okay, ladies, this is your chance to ask any question that comes to mind. Just unmute yourself and we'll try to do it one at a time. I'll go first if nobody else wants to go. Sure. Great. I'm going to stop sharing, okay. I think, if that's okay. Does that help so I can see everybody? Okay. So I just had my annual visit. And um, I've had double mastectomy and I've already finished all my chemo and all my radiation, but I had a lot of chemo. I did five months and then four months. And then after the mastectomy and the radiation, I did another six months. And now I'm on letrozole. And before all this, I had already gone through menopause. And so the whole dryness issue is a real problem. Yeah. And the gynecologist made the comment that the tissue, she said, was pale. So would some of these exercises that you were talking about tonight, like some of the, those poses that you had just finished up with, looked familiar to some of the things I've seen in some of the yoga classes I've taken, will that kind of help with blood flow or would that help with those tissues not being as pale is that even something that is addressed in this whole pelvic floor therapy or is that something that I need to circle back around with her and ask more questions about honestly when she made that comment that we didn't have a whole lot of discussion she just made, she said is you know obviously having intimate relations with your husband uncomfortable and I said well yes hmm. and we didn't really have a lot of more conversation with yeah. that it's not a not a real fun topic to have a you know coffee right. and casual conversation about so anyway right. that's my question yeah <laughs> absolutely thank you so much for sharing that but that is something I hear often. Um, a lot of our patients deal with vaginal atrophy. Um, they might be told that their tissue is thin, so they might experience bleeding during intercourse. Um, and I will say that those positions can be helpful. Um, they're going to help reduce the overall tension in the pelvic area. They might stretch on some of the connective tissue that can get a little bit tight and bound up. Um, and as pelvic floor physical therapist, we also do a lot of what's called manual therapy, which is hands-on work. Um, I didn't include it in our slide today because it can be a little bit much to kind of talk about it first for a lot of my patients, but we do a lot of manipulation inside the body where we kind of stretch those tissues. We might do almost like an internal massage, um, but we call it manual therapy because the goal is that we're actually changing the tissue. It's not just done to feel good. Um, so there are strategies that you can do that kind of help 
again, heal that tissue, bring some blood flow. But it is always important to talk with your doctors about certain creams and, and um, topical agents that can be taken sometimes to help with that as well. But sounds like that situation is maybe where you want to kind of reach out to your doctor and say, hey, is pelvic floor physical therapy an option for this? I think that's a really valid question. And sounds like your situation is something we could, could help with. Okay. That and that was going to be yeah. my, that was my next question is, was, is this something that you would get then a referral from, or is this something that you just kind of, I know there, there's another place that is in town that I've seen a brochure for, but I don't think that that's actually affiliated with a particular doctor's office. I think that's more of like a boutique. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of options. And I always want patients to know that they can go wherever they want to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people feel comfortable working with their oncologist because they know that the communication is there, if it needs to be, we have ready access to all of your medical history. So I think the comfort mm -hmm. level is there, um, but patients can always go wherever they want. And that's why I include those directories because I feel comfortable if any, if I were to send any patient to, to someone listed on there. Um, but in general, a lot of insurances do need referrals. Um, so talking with your oncologist about that, a lot of private insurance does not. Um, it just kind of depends on where you're wanting to go and how you're comfortable your doctor feels with all of that. North Carolina technically has direct access for non-Medicare patients. So they could walk in and make an appointment. And then we kind of, at least on Novant's end, we verify their insurance later and kind of say, okay, this is what it's going to cost you. Should you continue? Um, but yeah, you have a right to go wherever you would like to. And if your oncologist is at atrium, they also have a pelvic program as well. So yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for your yeah, help. Appreciate yeah. I hope that helps. Sure. Mm -hmm. Who would like to go next? <laughs> Hi, thank you. Oh, can I just jump in? Sorry, Lana. Yeah. Hey, Lana. Hi, how are you? Thank you, Amber um, and Virginia for all the information. Yeah. Um, I just have a question regarding, I've never heard of a pelvic floor problem until my sister had that problem. Yeah. So I guess, you know, then I'm very curious. And when this thing came up, I was like, oh, this is very interesting. I, you know, didn't know, you know whether it was hereditary or, but her, I guess her doctor gave her two choices. One was, um, is this prior to like a hysterectomy or when everything falls versus um, she spoke to another um, nurse practitioner and they said, no, there's so many solutions out there where you can start doing exercises or where there's a, something you can have a mesh or it's like a whole arena of <laughs> possibilities. And I was just thinking, is this a precursor to somebody having a hysterectomy when that is when your pelvic floor does not work anymore? Yeah. So definitely. Um, a lot of our presentation was kind of geared towards pelvic floor relaxation because that's often what we see in oncology population. But like Virginia slide said, I mean, we see all kinds of people. So in an ideal world, I would love to be able to see a patient before they have surgery um, because there are a lot of patients that respond to conservative methods. It's also our job to be very honest and ethical. If it's a situation where I don't feel like it's going to be helpful, um, it's our job to tell you that, right? Because ethically, I can't continue to see someone if I don't feel like it's helping or if it's ultimately not going to be the right fix. Um, but a lot of patients that deal with pelvic floor dropping or prolapse, it's usually graded to kind of mild and very severe. I would say pelvic floor definitely has a place in kind of those mild um, to moderate cases, and it can definitely keep it from getting worse, which if someone's not really having too many symptoms, sometimes that's absolutely all they need. So it's usually something that um, they can reach out to if they're going to have surgery or if maybe they've had surgery already. It's something they want to consider to kind of maintain what they've gained. It's absolutely an okay option for, for them, it sounds like. And I have a, a second question. Uh -huh. When you do these exercise 
these imaginary exercises because you can't feel it. Right. When you actually do a lot of yoga and all that, if you do all your exercises well, do you eventually feel your pelvic muscle at all or you never feel it? In some cases, yes. Sometimes all someone needs is just to kind of reduce the tension in their pelvis and then they kind of will feel it over time as some of the other external tissues get nice and pliable and soft. Um, But other times it requires a hands-on approach. Sometimes I have to put my hand right where the patient can feel it and say, you know, this is where you're going to bulge against me, or this is where you're going to contract. Sometimes my fingers are again, right internal, kind of right on those muscles saying, okay, this is my pressure. You should feel those muscles contract against my finger, feel those muscles contract as if you're pulling my finger inside of you. And sometimes that tactile manipulation and cue really kind of helps develop the neuromuscular system. So finally someone's like, oh, okay, that's where it's supposed to happen. And it kind of, it clicks. So a lot of times um, with kind of personalized treatment, they can definitely start to feel it. And the other thing too, is there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, A lot of my patients, I get at least again, one question a day of like, I saw this ad on Facebook for these shorts that you wear that do Kegels for you or, um, you know, all kinds of machines out there to help your pelvic floor pain. There's all kinds of stuff. But there are a few medically sound devices that help people do these contractions, but also help them feel it. We call it biofeedback, where we might use an external or internal probe and clinic to kind of help people feel that contraction, but also help them feel it relaxed. So sometimes that little cue that's very visual of like, oh, I did it, kind of helps them along too. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jill. Okay. So I'm wondering about this. Um, I developed a car uncle in early April, 2018. And now since all the cancer treatment, in addition to that, I have vaginal dryness and stress incontinence. And last December, I bought myself a mini trampoline. I don't feel like jumping on that little trampoline is making me worse. But what do you think? Is it okay that I do that? Yeah, I would say the majority time it's fine. But again, I would probably recommend that you have someone actually assess your muscles to see what's going on. Um, A lot of my patients do just fine with pure strengthening and mobility, but a lot of patients really need that hands-on cueing to get those muscles to relax first because I always describe it this way too. I don't know if you guys can see my shoulders here, but if I walk around like this all day and then I have myself contract, I can feel that, but over time, it's really not going to do much, right? So sometimes when someone's doing all the right things at home, but they never really get this to relax, it's really hard to feel like we're getting any better because the contraction is really not effective at that point. So to answer your question, probably fine, but if you're not really seeing change or improvement, I would usually recommend seeing someone just to double check what your muscles are actually doing down there. So if someone wants to come to your clinic, Mm -hmm. do they have to see a urologist first to get referred or can they just walk into your clinic and make an appointment? Yeah. So it depends if someone has private insurance, like your Cigna, Blue Cross, they have direct access so they can just call or walk in and make an appointment. Um, If someone has Medicare, they usually need a referral, but it can come from anybody. That's what's kind of neat is it can come from a primary care, come from gynecologist, urologist. It just needs to be a medical provider that can place referrals for you. Yeah. Not to, not to sound my praises, but again, we just really, really encourage patients to really get that one-on-one treatment if, if they need it. Because I see so many patients that have done this and done that for years and they really didn't get any change and um, it's kind of a bad spiral. So one thing I hear again every day is why didn't I do this sooner? So that's why I'm really here to just kind of emphasize the importance of like, you know, if you're ever in that situation where is this going to be helpful? 
there's no harm in trying it. The worst thing that happens is there's an evaluation and we say, hey, it's not really appropriate, but it was really cool to, to meet you. And, and that's pretty much all my patients have to lose in a lot of ways. So I'm very much an advocate for, hey, just have someone who's trained to, to check it out if you're, if you're struggling. I've got a question. Yeah. I'm Karen. Hi, Karen. Uh, I uh, enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Um, I had triple positive breast cancer and the procedure for reconstruction. I'm on Arimidex forever. It feels like, um, you know, to decrease, dampen any estrogen production. Extremely dry. Uh, atrophy, sex was extremely painful. Mm. Um, in what sequence would you? Uh, do any treatment. Um, I went to see an OBGYN who specializes in post-cancer and menopausal mm -hmm. um, issues. And she was talking uh, vaginal, uh, the cream with uh, estrogen, progesterone and estrogen and testosterone. Yeah. My oncology, my oncologist freaked out on that. And um, you know, so we talked options there. The OB, the GYN also mentioned, I can't remember the name of it. It, it replaced the Mona Lisa, mm -hmm. but whatever the newer version of that is. And she mentioned uh, pelvic floor uh, physical therapy, which would come in what sequence and uh, how effective is your therapy in terms of the vaginal dryness and the, the pain during intercourse. Sure. So again, it might be a little Yeah. I'd say I might be a little biased, but I, I typically love if someone can see physical therapy first in general, in general, because I don't know everyone's specific insurance plans, but I do find that we can be one of the more cost effective options and it's pretty conservative. So if we're trying to take less medication, like that's not anything we're going to deal with. Um, every once in a while, we're able to offer information about other alternatives to hormonal creams, um, such as natural lubricants and things like that, that can be really helpful. And sometimes people have tried that and sometimes not. Um, but what's cool about physical therapy is again, we kind of have the autonomy to say, okay, let's get you started with this stuff. And then if your doctor encourages you to have a procedure, it's not like you can't come back to us at any point. So um, I usually say, just get the ball rolling with physical therapy. If you find that's going to be helpful and sometimes you don't need these other options, but I would say there's no real specific answer to that. Um, it sounds like you're being well taken care of and they're recommending the right things though. So that's positive to hear. But with therapy from the pelvic floor, or, uh, the yeah. pelvic floor but, um, does that usually result in enough symptom relief, the dryness and the extreme sex uh, pain during intercourse? It can. I would say the majority of my patients do work with their doctors to kind of find some kind of cream or something topical to kind of help them along the way. Um, and again, just like a general, a very, very, very general guideline is a lot of my patients, if they're going to see change, they're typically going to see some kind of change after about eight weeks. Um, so sometimes I use that as just a very blanket guideline to kind of, you know, can keep it ethical and say, hey, you know, the last thing I want to do is bring you in, do something that's quite painful if we're not able to tolerate it. So we're very honest about we have a time and a place and that's what's lovely is we can also work with your doctors to kind of figure out if there's something they can do to make what we do a little bit easier. Um, yeah. So I hope that helps answer the questions. Yes. Thank okay. you. Yeah. And I'm in South Carolina. I'm in Fort Mill. Uh huh. Do you know if uh, Blue Cross, it, it, does private insurance in South Carolina require a referral uh, for this or is this another self-referral state? That's a good question. Virginia may know. I am pretty sure that all 50 states now have direct access, which means that if you have private insurance, you can see a physical therapist. I believe it's up to 10 visits without a referral, but 
for me personally, knowing that you have a, a cancer history, I would just feel so much more comfortable having someone from your medical team know that you're seeing me. Um, right. I would, yeah, I would recommend you getting a referral, but I will say that I, I right now I'm, I'm moving to practice at our cancer center, but there is another therapist at our Novant clinic here and it's in Steel Creek, but she is available and probably closer to you. Um, if you're looking for somewhere to go, um, I would encourage you to kind of explore some options, uh, but I do believe that all 50 states have direct access. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Karen, I would like to let you know that on September 13th, we are going to have a Zoom presentation on the Mona Lisa procedure. So oh, you, you may want to just tune in to see what your options are, um, because, you know, there are a lot of choices out there, um, as Amber mentioned. Um, but I do think seeing a physical therapist um, in the beginning is a great way to go. But I did want to let you know that we are going to be offering information about Mona Lisa. Wonderful. Thank you. Who else has a question? Amber and Virginia, you mm -hmm. both done a wonderful job tonight explaining everything on pelvic floor therapy. I only wish that I could have heard all of this like way, way back. Can you address like if someone had like endometriosis like years ago and they possibly have scar tissue and then after that point then have breast cancer and then they have to continue on with taking the aromatase inhibitors on how you can help people in that way too with scar tissue. Sure. So a lot of um, our treatment, again, kind of the examples we used here is just one very small part of what we do. A lot of our treatment includes hands-on techniques. Um, we call it myofascial release. I don't know if you've heard that phrase. I know you guys deal a lot with that um, where you guys are. So um, hopefully it's not too new, but myo means muscle and fascia is connective tissue. And I think in the world of breast cancer, maybe you're familiar with it because we talk so much about that as it relates to range of motion and the surgery that's been done on the chest wall. But a lot of patients that have abnormal tissue, scar tissue, fibroids, like you name it, they can have a lot of myofascial tension surrounding those foreign bodies. Um, and so a lot of times what we do kind of early on is just get our hands on those tissues, tell your body that, Hey, pressure and touch is not so much of a threat. It kind of helps reduce and remodel that scar tissue. So it's not so adhesed and creating pressure around the nerves. Um, it allows for improved mobility. I would describe it as a knot on a rope. Like we try to get that knot out so that when you're moving around, you feel like you can fully lengthen the rope that is your body. Um, so it plays a huge role when it comes to those types of diagnoses. And again, not to, um, I don't know, sound too straightforward here, but a lot of you guys have been through trauma too. So we know that trauma in our body, whether it's personal stress or physical trauma, repetitive surgeries and procedures causes a lot of myofascial tension. And so before patients even have a lot of these gynecologic symptoms, I try to get everyone to physical therapy to try to reduce that overall tension. And if you're sitting here right now and you're kind of like, hmm, I feel a little tense in my shoulders, you're probably also tense in your pelvic floor. So again, I'm a little biased, but I really think rehab's um, a great option for pretty much anybody, as long as it's appropriate for your medical team. But hopefully that answered your question. It did. Thank you. <laughs>